since a lot of you guys are, you know, just salary workers or entrepreneurs, uh, business folks, focus on how do you trade time for money the best, which is likely at your day job, but invest on the side to get you up to that certain point, build a portfolio of concentrated real estate was how a lot of the people on this top Forbes list got their money and they diversified it. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out and then he became one of the best of on today's podcast, I'm going to be going over some family office concepts that I picked up from a recent family office workshop I attended. So in this uh, workshop, they had a keynote speaker, Tony Robbins, which is cool. He's been getting involved with cross-promoting with guys like Peter Malouk, for those of you guys who have read his previous book. I don't think he works with them anymore. I think he works with this guy, AJ Gupta. But a lot of these guys, they'll advise high net worth, $100 million families and above. Here at Simple Passive Cashflow, myself and my other folks in my family office group, we are folks getting from $1 million to $10 million plus. There's not really any groups for that, so I decided to create it. If you guys want to learn more, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash journey. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today are geared for those $100 million network families and above. So you take it with a grain of salt, and I'll try and add in some color what really applies to the broke guys under five to $10 million net worth. For those of you guys checking out the YouTube version of this, this is just a, a part of the e-course, the ultimate e-course, which I'm gonna add in the notes in here later on. If you guys haven't checked out all the e-courses we have, including the free infinite banking one, you can check that out at passacashflow.com slash banking and check out all the e-courses. If you go to the top, I think there's a section for e-courses. But here's the first lesson that I learned. Now to get rich, you need to really concentrate what you do first. Now, a lot of you listening, you guys are just salary guys, um, high paid salary guys. A lot of you guys make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year plus per person. But the concept that they talked a lot about is if they looked at the people who got up to the Forbes 40 list, you know, your top billionaires, and then you take a look at the people that left that list, I think you'll find some very similarities where the people who got up to the list, they were very concentrated and the people who left the list lost a lot of net worth. They did that because they weren't diversified. And what got them there was ultimately what got them kicked off the list. Uh, great example, if you guys are familiar with Forever 21, it was like this Korean couple. They went all in on retail and just expanded like crazy. Some bad luck, which a 2008 recession happened and they rise of e-commerce. But what they should have done is they should have found a way to diversify maybe in the same industry to leverage their networks and current infrastructure but perhaps they should have diversified i think they lost well over half of their net worth well they got a billion bucks i'm sure but i think the bad way of taking this advice is being like i gotta be diversified and i don't want to lose my money but if you're under like 10 million 100 million dollars net worth i still think you're in the hey concentrate how you're making your money and because you're not to that point where you really can diversify. It's just important to keep it in the back of your mind. You know, once you hit your end game number, and for a lot of us in our family office group, you know, that end game number is maybe up $5 million. Uh, so what does this mean for us? Since a lot of you guys are you know, just salary workers or entrepreneurs, uh, business folks, focus on how do you trade time for money the best, which is likely at your day job, but invest on the side to get you up to that certain point, build a portfolio of concentrated real estate was how a lot of the people on this top Forbes list got their money and they diversified it. Now, so another point I had here, I don't have a BlockFi account. Well, I have a BlockFi account, but I don't really invest more than a couple grand in it. For me, it's a waste of time, right? My time is better spent finding real estate deals. So if you guys are working a pretty simple 40 to 50 hour a day job, and you've probably got some time on your hands. But no offense, your time might be better spent learning a little bit about Coinbase, BlockFi, some DeFi platforms, playing a little bit of money on there than to deal with a bunch of turnkey rentals or something like that. If you guys make over a couple hundred thousand dollars, a few hundred thousand dollars a year, I would say perhaps unless you're really ambitious and you don't have kids, got some free time on your hand, you've got a little bit extra bandwidth and you find it fun, if all those things line up, then yeah, knock yourself out or learn a little bit about it. I like the world of crypto is going, but for me, 
I've made the conscious decision as an operator of apartments that I need to focus on that and stay in my lane. Another thing that they talked about was this concept of avoiding locker room talk or the common guy. Once the common guy starts to talk about deals or hey, there's this great startup company or tech company that's coming up, my friend knows them, he, he trusts them. Or you know, the taxi cab driver talking about you know, some kind of deal, whether it's real estate or tech or just some business. And you start to hear these wordings of, you know, we're going to go 8 to 12x in the next few years, but you got to get in now. This is the last week. That's just a sign of a sucker deal. And that's what's really hard. When you're just some average guy, and I still put myself in this category, you're not getting access to good deals. You're just getting access to these sucker deals. If they were that great deals, you and I probably wouldn't really get access to them. Whenever there's like that false sense of scarcity, right? You got to get in now, man. There's this crypto thing is going to blow up. That's a surefire way to know of a scam, multi-level marketing type of thing. We've talked about that in the past in the investor letters where groups will pump up one garbage coin. And it just becomes like a Ponzi scheme where the first people who are in, they got out and then everything tanked as everybody is in that kind of vesting period. Another idea they talked about was if, if somebody came up to Shark Tank, you know, it's Mark Cuban, Mr. Wonderful, and they use that same conversation line, like we're going to eight to 12 X in the next few years, but you got to get in now. You, know, you get laugh off the set in that situation for a hundred million dollar net worth families again. You take it for what it's worth. The goal is to have eight to 12 non-correlated assets in your portfolio. The first question, what's a non-correlated asset? The non-correlated assets are like things that are not correlated with the economy. Now there are different varying degrees of this, but I probably put real estate, a commercial real estate in this bucket to some extent. Other pure non-correlated categories are like settlements. It's a morbid thing, but you can bet on people dying as you buy out their life insurance and you get paid out when the person passes away. That's nothing more sure than death and taxes. Other non-correlated things are, and this is what they, the life insurance companies, they invest in, right? Large institutional class A assets, in primary markets. Really nothing's more certain let lower return than that type of stuff. Eight to 12 kind of seems like a lot. No, I think what they're talking about is multiple deals, spreading your net worth out and having each of those to be non-correlated or like hedging each other within there. Me personally, most of my worth is in multifamily apartments, which I feel like is pretty safe. The need for lower middle-class housing, I don't think that need is going to be going away. In fact, I think the demand is stronger and stronger every day as our population in our country and the wealth gap increases. But I'm nowhere near $100 million net worth, but I need to be thinking, all right, how am I going to start to take, maybe I don't want the best returns, but I just want certainty. How am I looking for those non-correlated assets in the future? Some of this might be crypto, some of it might be gold. I don't do that stuff quite yet, but it's something I'm thinking about in the back of my head. The other thing that they said is cash is trash, and this is coming from the high net worth folks. Inflation is a lot higher than you think. Somebody mentioned that 40 years bull market in bonds ended last year, guys, where now $128 trillion is globally looking for parking right now. And you've guessed it, it's going into real estate. As you've seen, Blackstone are picking up little rental properties. I think they'll fail. They did this back in 2008 when, you know, the big institutions just aren't really good at managing assets, especially small little ones when they're all separated around. What they really want to be in is large multifamily apartments where they can buy them in big dozen sets. Another point was don't chase what is running. So crypto and tech are two things that are running in this point right now. You know, we talk a lot about emerging markets, buying in places where the, the population is growing because of some economic growth. And that's more from a geographic standpoint, but what they're not talking about is more from an asset, asset sector approach. Real estate is another place where it's always been an even kill. People think, well, real estate is getting really expensive, but on all, all, the highs and lows are pretty much smoothed out compared to tech bubbles and, and the crypto market. Try and look around what is the things that people aren't doing. Something that I was looking at was maybe a, a development deal in New York. I'm not going to do that, but like just thinking outside the box, right? Where is it that the unsophisticated money is not going into or is deathly afraid of. Maybe now is the time to go into shopping malls. I don't really believe that. I'm just joking there. And that's traditionally been beat up over the last several years. Perhaps now is the time to go into it. Getting outside the real estate world, what is something that 
the people, the rush has got passed and gone. Another thing we mentioned that the, the bond market is flipping. If the bonds can't get the yield we want, where do we go? So what are the high net worth families doing is they're buying businesses or alternatives investments, the out world. And that's essentially the world that I tell a lot of people to get into. Get off of the retail main street or wall street investments where you're getting killed by all these hidden fees and carried interest. Get into more alternative investments where you're directly investing with the sponsors, cut out all the middlemen and get into more non-correlated assets. Because the, the problem with all the, the retirement funds and 401ks and all these mutual funds is you're in these heavily correlated to the economy types of assets. It doesn't take a genius to make money in Tesla when the stock market is going like crazy, like how it is because of all the quantitative easing and fake money. And it's always going to make a run. The point is you don't know when it's going to drop. So smart families, what they do is they diversify and like you said, non-correlated assets. One thing, bonds are a way to get cash flow. And for people in our group, once we hit around three to $5 million net worth, our mindset starts to change. $5 million for most folks is enough money to just safely cash flow it. Maybe you're not going to get 12, 15% plus, but you can safely cash flow maybe eight to 10%. Take something like AHP, for example. I mean, you're not going to load up your whole entire portfolio with a non-performing note fund like that, but it's going to be a small piece of your portfolio so you can get diversification and it operates like a bond in a way where it's just meant for cash flow and security. But with the bond market going away and you know where do you go? The high net worth families, they buy businesses, not really for the growth potential, but the business is producing that cash flow every single month for them. Take it for what it is. Some of you guys are probably taking like that, well, I need to go buy a laundromat or I need to buy a car wash, one of those drive through car washes. Some of you guys, me personally, that what tells me is I'm going to go buy an apartment building or jump into a syndication where I don't have to do anything and I can get all the tax benefits without all the headaches. Maybe some of you guys who are a little bit more ambitious out there, maybe you go buy franchises. From another perspective, what you want to be doing is getting away from ordinary income. That's get what you come your day job, your 1099s, you guys contractors out there. You guys want to move from that spectrum to the passive income side. So you can use these passive losses to possibly offset your the income on that side. AJ Gupta is the guy that Tony Robbins kind of self um, promotes with. I think there's probably some kind of partnership there with referrals. A lot of these gurus, uh, they're just marketing referrals to other people in the space. I think Tony Robbins used to work with that Peter Muluk guy, but there was some kind of scandal or something. You guys can look up that type of stuff if you're interested. But you know, what's your asset allocation model? And we'll do this in our family office group, you know, where it's more applicable, right? People between one to $10 million net worth. If you guys join up that, we're not going to show you what this people in our, our private group are doing, but. What I'm going to outline here is what AJ said, what high net worth, $100 million families are doing. And not saying it's you know, right or wrong, but when I go through this, again, make sure that you're taking it with a grain of salt. Y'all aren't $100 million net worth. You guys are barely even 5 or $10 million net worth. Don't emulate what they do, but kind of take some things and you know, maybe if you can emulate what the high net worth are doing. First of all, you said 50% of his stuff is in real estate. And of that, the 40% which is the 80% of the 50% is in cash flowing multifamily style self storage, kind of like bonds we were talking about earlier for cash flow. The other remaining 10% of the 50% or the minority port of his 50% of his real estate portfolio is in land, which the purpose of that is to preserve value. So this is exactly what I've been preaching to you guys. All the newbies, they buy land and I'm like, that doesn't cash flow. That's what you do when you get to be five, $10 million plus. Or what AJ is saying here is $100 million net worth families, they don't need the cash flow. They've got $40 million in cash flowing multifamily and stuff like that, that they can afford to have some money just sitting in a land bank, not doing anything. This is what they do. This is probably not what you guys should be doing. 20% of their to total portfolio are in equities. Now this is the stocks. Probably they're not in mutual funds and stuff like that. They've probably got private managers that do it. But this is what the high net worth families, the very small portion of their money, 20% is in stocks. It's just, it should be shocking, right? Like, why is it that the average American is like 80 to 100% of this stuff? This is where success leaves clues. Do what the high net worth families do. And they are very small minority in equities. Probably because it's just, you know, convenient and easy for them.
and they've got you know, 50% in real estate cash flowing like crazy for them. The next thing that they have is private equity. So this is approximately 20% of their total portfolio and private equity is seen as businesses, but not necessarily the LP part. Now, when you're a hundred million dollar net worth family and above, you can push your weight around. And there's a reason why you got to that point in the first place. So there's some kind of operational value that you bring in that you can contribute in some substantial way to the general partnership. So this is where the rich are getting richer. These families will go into the general partnership, not saying it's real estate, but more like operating businesses where the family has built up the network and the synergies and the experience to add value in that system. So for example, say you are a guy you know, doing a pizza franchise, you made dozens of these things, you got your net worth to 50 to $100 million. Something that, I'm just making this up on the fly, something that might make sense to you is going and buying similar franchises that supplement, either it's very similar business model to the pizza franchises, or it is a supplement or it adds on and augments the returns of the pizza franchises. Maybe you go buy a bunch of breweries, I don't know, and combine the two. So these are seen as you know, more asymmetric returns. So this kind of counteracts the cash flowing assets, the 10% of their portfolio just sitting in lazy equity and land. This is the asymmetric part of the portfolio where you know, the private equity is somewhat speculative, depending what kind of business you're getting into. It's not really like cash flowing apartments or anything like that. These are more like businesses. It could just flop, but these are the, the opportunity for them to grow their net worths even more. And, but it's also hedged from the other side. And in this thing called what they call this tail risk, or you can think of this as insurance. So this was a new term that I caught on a little bit. So what they said is any bet that you're making, maybe take two to 3% of that bet and put it in something that hedges your investment so that should your investment go bad, that two to 3% greatly increases to offset your loss. I'm not, maybe in the stocks, maybe it's like kind of buying, I don't know what it's called, maybe like a call position or put position in something that does the complete opposite, or maybe buying a business that kind of supplements or is the opposite when you know one does well, the other does well. So for maybe if you have a short-term rental, maybe you have some long-term rentals. So again, this is the concept of tail risk. This is what high net worth families do, right? When you have a hundred million dollars net worth and above, when you're less than $10 million net worth, I don't know if you, if a tail risk is really that appropriate. I don't know if you know, putting money in land is that appropriate, but it's just something to think about, right? When you go into a deal, what is some way, where are you putting some money? So if the deal doesn't go as well because of the economy, because it's correlated with the economy, that piece can grow and make the hurt a lot less. Just some side notes here. They said maybe they like two to 3% in crypto, if not real estate, where do you go for storage of wealth? Now, real estate just checks all the box off this stuff. It's a hard asset. But the reason why you would want to do maybe just a little bit of crypto is because maybe you don't have the ability to operate real estate, then you get into syndication. But then again, the question is, what if you don't have the ability to find good, honest people to work with? And for those people, you know, you've got to look elsewhere. There, there are other groups out there that they'll teach people all about index funds all day long because their assumption is that you guys out there are unable to build relationships with people. Now, if you guys have been listening to this podcast for quite some time and we haven't talked, you haven't joined our investor group and signed up for our list, what are you guys waiting for? That's probably the majority of you guys. I I've, I've probably have maybe two calls a day with you guys and we'll continue to do so until it becomes too much. But if you guys are one of those people out there who've been listening for several years now and have never really engaged with me, yeah, like real estate probably ain't your thing. You're just not a good people person. And that's cool. You're really losing out. But then, yeah, that's if you're unable to play nice with others and build real relationships, because for high network people, your network is your net worth, then that's what you get. You get the scraps. Go after your index funds and go off of that. They say two to 3% crypto, if not real estate, where do you get the storage of wealth? Maybe they're saying gold and silver, which is the alternative to crypto. Suffice for the same thing, which is just about storage of hard assets. And this is a big mistake I see for people that are under $5 million net worth. They load up on a large amount, maybe like five, 10% plus of their net worth in gold. And this is the, what I was saying. My first point was just because the high net worth people 
are doing this stuff doesn't mean that you should. Be very careful, the people that you see, the gurus that you see on the internet. A lot of the time, ask yourself, how are they making money? A lot of these guys will just be pushing out as affiliate marketers for gold and silver and just trying to scare the heck out of you so you go into gold and you buy from them and they make their three to five percent. So I don't have any gold. If I were to if I really wanted to hedge myself for currency and I wanted to just store wealth, which I don't know if it's very prudent if your net worth is under $10 million, I'd probably do crypto. But I don't trust myself to hold those cold storage wallets, so I'll probably be doing it in an index fund, which, sure, I'll pay an expense ratio of 1%. There might even be some carried interest. There's a lot of um, good ones out there. There aren't really that many ETFs really yet, but very soon I'm sure you'll be able to get into this stuff where you don't have to run around with a plate of engraved garblings of your password. And have to worry about that type of stuff to me that's where i i'll pay for that convenience and at least that i'm not the uh, single point of failure to forget my password another important thing that these guys preach was reshuffling your asset allocation now this is i tell a lot of people on our group right every year take a look at your investments maybe 20 percent off that are your losers that don't have the good return on equity i um, might want to say what's return on equity well if you have debt equity sitting in your homes or rentals Get that out. Check out the page at simplepassivecashflow.com slash ROE for that worksheet there. But yeah, reshuffling your asset allocation, figuring out what is your your most pain in the butt properties to. And then always be pruning it, right? Selling off those assets, putting it into new stuff, keeping it fresh. Same thing that the high net worth do. And something that they said that really stuck with me is do this when things are good. Because selling the good ones is hard. Because essentially what you're doing is you're increasing the losers, right? But when things are bad, you're going to be really wishing that you did this. Now, some of you guys might have, you know, you started with a very prudent 5% of your net worth into crypto. I still think that's a lot, but now it's 30 to 40% in crypto and you're still riding that. But what happens when you lose half of it overnight? You're going to be wishing you went, you put 25% of your net worth into real estate where, yeah, you weren't, you're not going to make a potentially high return. But in that next reshuffle, which will always happen, you have it there. And part of this is just like mindset. If you've made a bunch of money in crypto or some other elsewhere or your business, put it to somewhere where you can reliably make good cash flow and it's a good store of wealth. I don't think anything is better than real estate at doing this. And of course, diversify it out in, over multiple assets. But it's kind of like this thing where it's a lot of the stuff we talked about here from these family offices maybe don't apply to listeners here today. You still have to grow your net worth to me until you get up to $10 million net worth. Now, maybe $5 million is your number. That's where you personally hit zero gravity or escape velocity. At that point, now start to change your portfolio to more of the, the bond model. You're going after more cash flowing businesses for cash flow. You're going into asymmetric risk or, or limiting your asymmetric risk types of deals and going into insurance. Oh, I forgot to mention that 5% of these guys net worth is in life insurance, that type of stuff, infinite banking, right? That's the exact stuff we're talking about. Simple com slash banking to read all about that and get the free e-course by signing up there. They also mentioned there are some follow-up questions too, about like NTFs, that's a big rage right now. And they said, they were very like timeless about how they gave this advice because I think right now you have a lot of YouTube videos. Everybody's into NTFs. It's not the thing to talk about other than ALC's dress or right, tax the rich type of stuff. But they say collectibles have always got up and down in, in waves. And NTFs is just more of a virtual thing, but collectibles like art, wine, maybe not baseball cards, but the time, these are timeless rare valuables that have always come up in waves and it's important to understand when it's high, when it's low, and now it's high. So don't be the, be the sophisticated investor and do not buy now. And they always, they, they said the same, it's always been a very timeless piece of advice to buy two cases of rare wine, save one, but drink the other. And they also close things out. And this is a, what we talk a lot about in our family office group is more of the legacy creation, teaching the next generation about wealth. All too often, I think what typically happens for first generation wealth people is that you know, we spend all this time, you know, maybe we do it the wrong way, the 401ks, mutual funds, buying a house to live in, right out of college, that type of stuff, or as soon as we get money. Ultimately, it just, we, we do this the wrong way where it doesn't, it takes 
maybe to your 50s, 60s, to get finally get financially free for most people. And in that time, your kids have gone. They're, they Once they hit 15, 16 years old, you've lost that opportunity to model the next generation. And that next generation, sure, you're going to pay for every means to go to the to get college educated. But I think the problem is where you lose impact of the next generation, the unborn generation, the grandchildren, because all their parents, all your kids are going to be able to teach them is how they went to college. And that may or may not be their thing. And we all know that what where they're going to be putting their money, investing in their money is going to be in the wrong places. They're not going to learn how to make money. This is why you know, for a lot of people that have joined our group, I, I tell them, hey, Give them the incubator, remote investor e-course to your kids. Have them learn about this baseline level of stuff. They're not accredited investors yet. They don't. They shouldn't be going to syndications yet. But have them learn about the basics now to learn what's inside the black box, so that when they are passed on the wealth, they know about how rental property works. They just know basic business skills and how the world works. And of course, the the last thing here is health is wealth. The difference between somebody with a hundred dreams and only one is in the, so the difference between someone with a hundred dreams and only one is their health. If you think about it, right now a lot of you guys are healthy, but if somebody told you in the next few months you're going to die because you have some terminal illness, you know you only have one thing in mind, which is your is just surviving. Well, un unfortunately, most people make changes in life until they're forced to. You know, this can be said for a, a lot of things. My I'm, something I'm thinking about lately is the choice to quit my day job and do this stuff full time, help people you know, learn about real estate and get into deals. Now that was a big choice for me. But once I made that choice, you know, my destiny was formed and I moved along this path. I, in that case, I made the decision. It wasn't like a situation where things just got so busy and I was forced to do it. Maybe if you guys are not thinking in the back of your head of something that you guys need to make a big change on, be proactive. Don't be somebody who lets destiny force you into making that change. Make it yourself and control it and hold on. So that's all we got for today, guys. If you guys like, if you guys want me to share more stuff like this, um, let me know. And, you know, we talk a lot about this stuff every couple of weeks in our family office group, which we don't have any hundred million dollar net worth families and above and nor I don't think you would want to. But, you know, I think if you guys are somewhere between a million, few million dollars net worth, you know, that's pretty much where the average in our folks are, are at. Everybody's still working. Everybody's really busy. So it's meant to be a side financial club onto already what busy plate you guys are working on. Every group out there, they're trying to teach broke guys how to get rich doing big deals. There's really no other group than our family office group. We're teaching you guys how to just keep doing what you're doing in terms of your highest and best use at your jobs, your salaries, your businesses. But how do you invest the right way and how, you know, what deals to go into, who to stay away from. We help cultivate best practices for tax, legal, then we connect you with the right professionals to make that happen. But the biggest benefit is the network. And as you start to create your own family office, start to emulate what the $100 million families are doing and above, you're going to need a peer group, the people that are on the same trajectory and on the same path as you, people you trust that you can rely on. For more information on that, go to simplepassivecastle.com slash journey. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.